Friends in Edinburgh celebrated the occasion uh, very appropriately, but some of I like to the party, so we might as well continue into the weekend, and that's what, that's what we're doing now. Um, well, he is the, well, second most famous poet of the 18th century, the most famous one being his older contemporary, um, Alistair MacBeister Alistair, or Alexander MacDonald, the celebrated Jacobite poet. Um, in some ways, I think Donald McBurn is the more um, interesting of these two. Um, and Gaelic singers tell me that um, his songs are the more singable ones, too. Now, Recording in progress. He was known as Donald McBurn and Norden, Donald McBurn of the songs. And in a culture where poetic expression came naturally and invariably in song, that is high praise for a poet indeed. Uh, the image, which I'm sure some of you will have seen before, is the commemorative pair mm -hmm. at Donald birthplace, which the uh, Gallic Society of Inverness put up um, in 1984 it was. Okay, let's see if I can get this to move. Yeah. <coughs> there we go. Now, Bhagavan was born on the 20th of March, 1724, in a tiny, tiny settlement called Dunleer. And that's just north of Kenrovi, just to the west of the modern Inverroran Hotel. And that's where he spent his early years. He came from a family of small tenants. They worked a joint farm. And as was common for people of his class, the poet did not get much formal education when young, if any. The parish school was just too far away to walk to, and anyway, schooling would have been possibly out with the means of his family. And like so many small farming communities all over the Gaelta, the Highlands and Islands, that were home to so many people in Donegal Brown's day, to Mariette, is now deserted. So that's what it looks like now. And here you see the view from Donovan Burns' front door, more or less. And it was dominated by Van Doren, the mountain which he later celebrated in a series of songs, which many regard as his finest and very beautiful they are indeed. Now, when we took this picture to Liert, that's me for scale, um, it was totally unusual for that part of the world, a bit cloudy, and five minutes later we ran from the rain. But we got our picture, so that is, this is good. And if you look on the right, that is Ben Dorda in, in its full glory, taken from a slightly from a different perspective. So it is a very uh, obvious mountain. So the poet's childhood at Julia was spent roaming freely, playing, and as he grew older, helping with the tasks of farming. He also spent time with local singers and storytellers and developed a love of the Gaelic language and its possibilities for song making. His models were the songs that were current in his area. They were love songs, lullabies, work songs, songs in praise of the praiseworthy, elegies for those who have died, and so on. So he uh, absorbed the uh, conventions and modes of expression of a rich and varied tradition when young. He would have been familiar with village poetry as well, songs made in response to local events and involving local people, expressing approval or criticism or just commenting on the funny side of life. He also grew up in the run-up to the last Jacobite Rising. So he must have come across Gaelic songs that explained Jacobite history and politics and that sought to recruit supporters to the cause. Although um, he lived in an area where the Hoyt clan Campbell held power, so he wasn't subjected to the full Jacobite propaganda machine of the time. <coughs> All these influences come together in his own work to a greater or lesser degree and he honed his craft until he found his own unique poetic voice. And that happened 
at this event, the Battle of Falkirk in uh, January 1746. So, when the last Jacobite rising started, John Caban was 21 years old, and that's an age when adventure and daring do is much on the minds of young men. So, John Caban thought, here's an opportunity to make a name as a brave warrior for myself. And he joined, not Charles Edward Stewart's army, he joined the Angara militia on the side of the government. He was probably not so much motivated by political conviction um, as by a desire to win heroic glory, and he had a financial incentive too because he was a substitute for Archibald Fletcher of Cranach, who at the age of 70 felt that fighting was not for him, and he promised them about 300 mercs, Scottish currency in those days, if he went and joined the militia in his stead. And that was a lot of money for a young man from humble circumstances. So off the poet went, having borrowed Fletcher's sword because he didn't have one of his own. And then at the Battle of Holpik, the government army was routed by the Jacobites and Donald fled along with the militia, and he lost the borrowed sword alongside his heroic pretensions on the way. Eventually he returned home, wanted his money from Fletcher, and Fletcher said, no, he lost my sword. <laughs> so Donald felt that was really rather unfair. It was his fault that the Jacobites were just better. Um, so he made a song about it. And justified his actions at the battle. He tells us the Jacobites and Clan Donald and Mongol were just the better fighters. And anyway, Fletcher's sword was useless. It was dreadfully uh, unheroic, basically a lump of rust, rusty iron. So we can look at a, uh, an extract now. I won't read all the Gaelic for you. Um, I've pulled the Gaelic text out from the first edition of 1768. The translations are from Angus MacLeod's magisterial edition of Donacha Barnes' work for the Scottish Gaelic Text Society. So, a wee bit. Jährig fuhrhus an sin ruhe kreim, nur dach ruhig an sfuhrle lehet. Wa prins charge hat flanke, sie hat in gala chachna rahat. Gaat durchin, fach auf den Mann, a jährig an neid in Skahu. Ach, kam es skui, fach im Kreim, skutschakin, bin retin, hast. So here is a very disarmingly honest one of the band talking about his reaction to the Jacobite charge. He and his fellow militiamen just panicked and ran. The prince is here described a little well, obliquely, obliquely as having a superior force, and then the poet is much more explicit in pointing out that um, the command structure on the government side just broke down and they simply went told what to do. The last line here sits between the serious and the humorous. Are these people that are missing, missing in action? Or were they so scared that they're still running and haven't stopped? There is an undercurrent of sympathy for the Jacobites running through the song, but it's done very skillfully, and the poet could deny any seditious intention if any, anyone challenged what he was doing in this. Later in the song, he has a go at Fletcher's reaction when he returned home minus that sword. Um, Fletcher was probably not too happy here being compared to a grey badger. And while the poet may not have been all that heroic in battle, he certainly had the courage to take on a well-respected man in a higher social position. So he closes that stanza with a very sonorous description of the ancestral weapon, Koyev Shinchirat Ahenet, his grandfather's ancestral sword, and then he follows it up with a very hilariously exaggerated description of what a bad sword looks like. More than earin, erweg fervid. So 
Vigas Yulan said in the hitch, Se hot down, re kappa, fiarna. Smadig, a garter, and rock rahed. In Gallic poetry, you get traditional descriptions of gleaming, elegant, keen edged, blue fluted swords of superior workmanship. That's not what you've got here. You've got the opposite. It's poorly maintained. It's twisted. It's too heavy even to be carried around easily. And far from being an heroic weapon, this sword was likely to draw ridicule from onlookers. Jonathan, what are you doing with this lump of iron? Are you going to fight with that? Ha ha. So by implication, Fletcher and his forebears, who owned this implement, were not heroes either. And given the sword's unheroic history and its poor state of repair, how could poor Don Khatban possibly have succeeded? Footnote, in the end, he got his money, but the Earl of Brudal will have to intervene. And here we have one of the various Earls of Brudalban uh, of Don Khatban's lifetime. <coughs> and at some point after the war of life, not too long after, Don Khatban found work as a gamekeeper on the Highland estates of the Campbell Earls of Bredalbin. And that line of work suited him very, very well. He loved that uh, time as a gamekeeper. And the third Earl here, John Campbell, they were all called John Campbell for several generations. Um, this one in particular acted as a, the Earl's patron in various ways. It's quite likely that some of Don Hubbard's songs in praise of assorted Campbells of the gentry were commissioned either by the Earl or other Campbell gentlemen in the orbit of the Bredalbin family. Most of the poet's finest nature poetry was composed during his time as a gamekeeper. And he demonstrates the skills of very precise observation and very detailed description and that enables him um, to bring the places that he celebrates in his songs to life. You get very, very rich evocations of landscapes, of mountains, of streams. And this, these landscapes are populated by deer and other wildlife. You get images of lush and flourishing plant life. And of course, the poet's own delight in being out and about in such an environment. Later in his career, the poet switches to uh, or composes a series of songs in praise of Gaelic, so the praise tradition is um, something that Don Khaban is a major exponent of and an innovator in. So he talks about songs in praise, uh, he makes songs in praise of the Gaelic language and the music of the bagpipes. And several of these songs won him the first prize in an annual poetry competition that uh, the Highland of Sci Society of London was running. So, fast forward to the beginning of the 1760s. And it's likely that uh, Don Khatan had quite a reputation as a poet by then. So his audiences expected him to comment on uh, important events. And one big important event was, of course, the accession of George III in 1760, and later, um, a year later, his coronation. So, Donovan may have, may have decided himself that the, the accession of a new king was a suitable subject for, to comment on, or perhaps the third general commissioned the song. And as a well-connected politician and a member of the House of Lords, the Earl might well have had an interest in ensuring that the people under his sway on his estates remained well affected towards the ruling monarch, and a song by a well-known poet could easily serve as a propaganda tool in that respect. So that's the background to Orden Don Ri. Now the young king came to the throne in a time of conflict. The Seven Years' War was in full flow at the time, so uh, some patriotic sentiment was called for. And Don Khaban certainly puts in a good effort to create his panegyric for the new king. The song begins with a toast, drunk in Spanish wine and punch, 
uh, for the new king and devotes the entire stanza actually to the process of toasting and drinking. I'll just give you the first line. Um, this is the toast of the king we wish for. You can take that two ways. Is it the king of the drink that the community that the poet represents wishes for? Um, probably an excuse for a party, the coronation of the king or the accession of the king. And given the fondness of the Jacobites for drinking the health of the king over the water, there is a playful ambiguity in that whole first stanza and that is present until the poet removes any doubt in the second stanza and that's where he identifies the king um, very clearly as the great grandson of the first Hanoverian king. Small and son as Anson Rie van der Gij and Rie Scho Groener, Anson Aadje de Gehrinslag, and Doris Ginschenet voor Boegis, Alpen is Sassenisering, Nisch het Geerken van Rijer, maar een hartjes Rie van Rijer en een Gorger en Boos Eert. So this endorses George as a king who is universally accepted throughout his domains in Scotland, England and Ireland. So it emphasises or um, describes a new post-Jacobite unity never before, never seen before, yeah, um, that did perhaps not quite reflect reality everywhere, but no doubt it was true as a general trend. Mm. The king's right to the throne is confirmed in a suitably loyal phrase called Ruhrisch, translated as dynastic rights, which is a phrase that would sit quite happily in a Jacobite song celebrating a Stuart king. So Gamachabad pulls in Jacobite um, uh, ideas, Jacobite expressions um, in his song to George III. The war that is in progress is duly referenced in the song, but the emphasis here lies on the successes of Britain and her allies. But the poet highlights the Gale's military prowess, uh, in particular as something that contributes to these successes. He also takes the distrust of the Gales after the that, that followed the 45 into account here. Um, yet for a time they were held suspect as if they were alien to the nation. But he also represents the current war as an important step in the rehabilitation of the Kuchel since they are now fighting bravely and honourably for the Hanoverian king's cause. And this is where it gets very interesting, because later on in the song, Dunkerban lists the improvements that the Gales hope for under this new king's reign. And he lists a few benefits that the Gales have already received. Smaller than you get pay it, squeal your hula mass on you. Good a dovage, egg of alpha, sweet chicken, a damage and water. But his spoils in the gown, a lost in fire at clown fallen. Sieves in Adamus third of Gaela, or says Charlene Govey's foresight. Hmm. Right. And he starts with the, uh, the improvements of the infrastructure um, that had already begun under General Wade back in the 1720s, were still being expanded in the 1760s. The second half of the century also saw an expansion of the school system, mostly under the auspices of the society in Scotland for the propagation of Christian knowledge. But what hasn't happened yet in 1760 or 61 is the repeal of the Disarming Act and the Act of Prescription, and Donald Van clearly sees these as the necessary next step for improving the lives of the Gales. So, at this point, the prohibition on tartan, of tartan was still a cause of great resentment among the Gales, because Don Ban puts it in here, in his praise to the new king. Um, now, 
One of the functions of praise poetry is to remind the recipient of his duties towards society. And so Don Rebaan uses an old convention here um, to very good effect. He has already in the song highlighted the loyal military service of the Gales in the Seven Years' War. So the Gales are fulfilling a part of a bargain between the crown and the people. And now it's time that the new king fulfills his. Um, one interesting point here is that the ongoing improvements that Don Caban lists are very modern, very contemporary, roads, bridges, schools, and the next improvement that he wants the king to make is a cultural one, and in allowing the Gales to wear tartan again. It, tartan has symbolic value still. It would allow the Gales to express their identity in visual terms without being tainted with a suspicion of being Jacobites. The Highland regiments, of course, were allowed to wear tartan uh, already, but um, he wants that expanded to the, the rest of the Gales. So we are looking here at an underlying agenda of rehabilitation of the Gales in the eyes of the rest of Britain, and the king can contribute to that. Well, the poet had to wait for, for that uh, to happen for a little while yet. But meanwhile, a little more biographical information, because around the year 1767, Don Rapan left the Highlands with his family to make his home in Edinburgh. The city was home to a large number of Gales at the time already, Gales of all social classes, and the McIntyres would be able to participate in an existing network of Gaelic-speaking expats for work, support, and of course, social life. The motivation for Donald Byrne to give up the life of a gamekeeper that he loved so much is no doubt complex. There was the need to provide for his growing family. Um, it is perhaps the matter of the changes due to the introduction of sheep farming being felt in his home district, and maybe his own sense of adventure could have contributed to his decision as well. So, he took advantage of the connections and patronage of the third Earl of Bredalden to secure a new job, and that was um, becoming a member of the Edinburgh Town Guard. So, this was Edinburgh's precursor to a proper police force. Um, a lot of its members were Gales. The pay wasn't large, but Don Caban earned enough to um, keep his family fed and with a roof over their heads. Uh, there's a reenactment group in Edinburgh who have very painstakingly recreated the uniforms. This um, the gentleman there on the left is um, uh, wearing the uniform of a captain, so Don Caban's outfit would be much plainer. Um, and much more modest. In the poet's day, uh, the town guard was led by captains who had previously served in the army, and you can see three prominent man ones on the right that Dunkelbaum would have known. Now, contemporary accounts paint the members of the town guard as not the smartest set of guardians of law and order. <coughs> Make of that what you will. But Don Haban <coughs> found the work continual enough, the hours weren't overly long, the duties weren't overly burdensome, and he had plenty of opportunity in his downtime to get to know his fellow citizens and to take part in the life of the city. And from what we can see of the poet's time in Edinburgh, he developed links with fellow girls from many walks of life in the city. There we are. The old town was where a lot of Gales settled in the 18th century before the new town was built. So Dr. Ban had a... Ooh. I need to go back. I skipped one. 
there, that's the old town. The red star shows the town guard um, barracks, so Jonathan Barr had a very short commute to work. Uh, the yellow star shows you where the first Gaelic chapel was set up in 1769 to minister to the spiritual needs of the city Gales belonging to the Church of Scotland. And this is, of course, where Don Khaban and his family would have worshipped too. Right, and now we can do a little market picture, maybe. There. There we go. Now, the bustle of the old town and its closes and streets and so on would have been very, very familiar to the poet. Before the wealthy and the fashionable decamped to the new town, all social classes would meet and mingle in the closes, in the streets, in the shops, and of course in the taverns. One of the band's wife, Mary, had a little hostelry in the lawn market, which no doubt became a meeting place for the city's gales and somewhere for Donald Hopin to sing his songs and socialise. And there may be yet another motivation in his decision to relocate to Edinburgh, and that's the publication of his poetry. You could say that in the world of Gaelic song of the 18th century, Donald Hopin at that point was rock star famous. He's unusual in that he saw three editions of his own poetry in his lifetime. First in 1768, second in 1790, third in 1804, and they all were expanded to include the material he had composed in the meantime. And that's pretty good going for a poet with very little formal education. He could sign his own name, but he certainly wouldn't have had the skill set to see his poetry through the, through the press. So he had help writing his poetry down, typesetting it, proofing it, and then with a the printing. So it appears that his parish minister back home, the Reverend Joseph McIntyre of Benorchy, put him in touch with a young clergyman who could help Don Rebaan. And that's the Reverend John Stewart, who hadn't yet found a parish to settle in. Later, he got the parish of Lass and was very much involved in the later stages of the Bible translation. Stewart's father was the Reverend James Stewart of Killin, who was involved in the earlier stages of the Bible translation, and the first installment had appeared in 1767, so it's quite possible that Stuart Jr. cut his teeth uh, in Gaelic publishing on the Bible project. If you look at the wider intellectual landscape of Gaelic in the 18th century, ministers in Gaelic-speaking parishes were very much involved in many, many projects. Translation, publication, and collecting of material from oral tradition. Ministers were well placed to do that because they were among the relatively few individuals who were fully literate in Ghana. And they were also, through their university education, in touch with contemporary literary scholarship. And they also had grown up in a Gaelic environment, so they knew good Gaelic poetry when they heard it being sung. So it's hardly surprising that Don Rebaan became a prime candidate for publication. It also helped that the poet was not given to making controversial political statements or to spouting Jacobite propaganda very loudly as some other poets still did. And then there is the Earl of Bredalban, who was a significant figure in politics at the time, um, giving patronage to the poet. So there was a degree of establishment endorsement in his poetry too. We don't know how the first edition was marketed, but we, we know what happened with the second and the third ones. Both were published by subscription, where buyers of the book paid for it upfront pre-publication. 
So crowdfunding is nothing new. They knew how to do it in the 18th century. And it was a great way, in various ways, you could reach the interest in a publication by the number of subscriptions you were able to collect. And you also generated money up front that you could then use for printing and so on. So it was good because it minimized the financial risk for the author and for the printer as well. Dan Kaban did the public relations. He went on tours all over the Highlands to solicit subscriptions and he was really good at it. In 1790, he got a whopping 1,478 subscribers from all over the place. 673 in 1804 when he was getting on a wee bit and couldn't get quite uh, about quite as far. Um, there are other reasons why the numbers are lower as well. And um, it's a good thing that he got these subscriber lists because they're printed in the backs of the books. You can go and see if any ancestors of yours are in there. And also, if you bought a book by subscription, your name was in, if your name was included, that gives you bragging rights. I supported a literary venture. So, Stan Kupan was here able to tap into all sorts of networks of gales of all social classes. Um, and whenever he went on holiday back home, that's what he did, collected subscriptions, and then when, when, he, when he had enough money, the books came out. Uh, he also print, had um, pamphlets of individual poems printed up from time to time, and they were sold, and we still have some ex examples of them. Here's one page um, which shows uh, a bunch of Macintyres subscribing to the book, so you can amuse yourselves by looking for uh, those who are from the Glenorchy area who might well be relatives of the poet. But you also see other information in there. You get um, a glimpse of a wider geographical uh, distribution. I see someone from Glasgow there, a few from Edinburgh, and um, all sorts of places. You also see the occupations, gardeners, shoemakers, merchants, dyers, carpenters, and so on. And a lot of the subscribers that you see here don't belong to the usual book buying classes of the great and the good and the literate. So um, here, um, of course, um, you get those too. But what you get here is ordinary gales, people of Donald Barnes' own social class. And admit it, if one of your mates published a book, you'd want to copy, copy two bragging rights again. We have four Edinburgh subscribers on this page, and the big red arrow shows you Mrs. Mary McPherson of Roxburgh is close. And we may safely assume that this is the poet's wife showing support for his literary venture as well uh, in 1790. A plaque was put up in the entrance of Roxburgh's Close in 2014 by Historic Scotland as was, so um, this can still be admired in its, all, in its full glory there, and I'm quite proud that I managed to intimidate them in putting the accents where they should go because <laughs> Historic Scotland had a bit of a, of a, has a bit of an issue with spelling on on those great metal plaques that they put, put up. So, I thought um, it would be quite interesting for you to see uh, how many subscribers were in your own area here. So I've added them up for 1790 for Oban, Lawn, Appin, Bendelock, Glenorch and Glenetta. So that's 103. That's not too shabby, is it? Um, there, there are probably more. Uh, because I have some place names on the subscriber list that I haven't been able to pin down to a location. Um, so this is my minimum estimate for my own little database of this. In 1804, from the same locations, you have uh, 116. For some reason, this has gone up a bit, so uh, I haven't quite worked, figured out why, why that is possibly, possibly just one of those statistical blips. And of course, you get among 
all the subscribers, the great and the good. You get the gentry, they subscribe to, to more than one copy. You get ministers in, um, of the church, officers in the army, lawyers, doctors, schoolmasters, people in the professions, in other words. So um, these um, subscribers haven't been mined to yield all the information that they contain. It's a very exciting, very interesting source for Gallic history in various um, levels, uh, various levels. So back to more poetry. A very important point to note is that Gallic poets don't write poetry, they compose songs, uh, certainly in Dr. Barnes' day. It's important to remember that almost all Gallic poetry of the time was meant for performance as songs. So our poet is very traditional in that respect, but he's also at the cutting edge of dissemination of his poetry in a new medium, certainly for Gallic literature, and the new medium is the medium of print that is um, only just beginning to be used for Gallic literature at the time. His readers would have been close enough to the tradition to read even the printed texts of songs. They would have known the tunes of many of the songs, and some tunes are specified in the editions. And remember, our poet would have been known as Don Kapan, none more than Don Kapan of the songs. I've mentioned praise poetry before, and here is one of my favorite examples. Well, we don't know nowadays, you'll be hard pushed finding anyone praising a banker for anything. <laughs> um, but in those days, um, things were a little different, and this individual is very interesting. Praise poetry quite often praises those in power and follows fairly predictable parameters. The addressee is praised for personal beauty, nobility of descent, wealth, generosity, fighting skills, fairness, personal piety, social and political connections, and so on. Um, and here we have John Campbell, the banker, uh, cashier of the Royal Bank of Scotland from 1745 onwards until his death, and a notable figure in Edinburgh society in Donald Barnes' day as well. Now, Campbell's banking career in the top job might have come to a very sudden end because he was one part of the group of banking officials who handed over a large part of the bank's money to Charles Edward Stewart in 1745 in uh, Edinburgh, and that uh, helped finance the rising. Afterwards, Campbell and his colleagues were able to give a plausible account of themselves that prevented them from being punished as Jacobite sympathizers. But maybe his political sympathies are a little suspect, or maybe he was just hedging his bets back then. But the fact is that around 17th 59, he had this rather splendid portrait of himself painted um, by William Mossman wearing tartan at a time when tartan was prescribed. Now, Campbell was a relative of the Bredalban family and he spent much time on their estates in, the, in, in his youth. Uh, he was a long, long time acquaintance of Donald Barnes. The song make, goes well beyond the panegyric tick-off list of positive attributes. There is a definite personal touch which shows that the poet knew and respected his subject. Of course, you get the conventional images of Cam Campbell's ancestry as well. On his father's side, he was the grandson of the first Earl of Bredalbum, and he was also the great-grandson of the ninth Earl of Argyll. So that is pretty much um, Campbell aristocracy. So here's a wee bit from the song. Ah, there. <laughs> 
we fought school and we called yesterday. Now how can I beckon some fest as it starts for lack of your last to flake it with your all? So he greets the banker directly and draws attention to his profession of the cashier of the Bank of the Royal Bank of Scotland. Now, whether this is a tongue in cheek reference to Campbell's actions in 1745 or just a general rec recognition of his banking career, I'm not sure. Um, as is often the case with Jonathan Bynes' poetry, there may be a slight political subject here, subtext here that he can deny. He briefly, um, this is a fairly conventional passage praising the subject's personal beauty, and certainly a bit reminiscent of that famous portrait, although those calves that are mentioned in the last few lines in the song could have been clad in breeches and silk stockings rather than kilt and hose. But the description of face and figure is very typical um, throughout the Gaelic song tradition. Nature poetry is particularly prominent in Donagh uh, uh, good. And here is a little bit from a very long song, Molten Dora in the Praise of Ben Dora, which is modelled on the classical music of the pipes and Piperach. Other changes in meter and rhythm in the song echo the different movements and variations of a piping composition. So the poet changes between Urler, the grand, the tule, and the variations in his metrical scheme and concludes the song appropriately with a cool loop. Deer play um, a prominent role in the poem, and we are given a stalker's view of their habits and movements. So here we're first introduced in this extract to a group of stags. Then the scene shifts to a herd of hinds and calves as they move along the horizon. The placing of a creature anchors the description in a specific location on Bendora. And finally, there's a very lovely note of admiration when Donald Brown points out the lightness and nimbleness of a hind bounding out of sight. No, the heen is the hang in the heat in a young Casaltic and half a paranian for putting the young and edith na rear. And here we have more description of deer. Where Jonathan Byrne describes the sounds of the deer in musical terms. And he builds up a contrast between the roaring of the stag in the rutting season and the much quieter communication between a hind and her calf. So, looking at the times, I think I need to move on a little bit. Um, and move on to the habitat of the deer, which Dunkelbahn was, of course, very intimately familiar with. So, um, we are here invited to imagine a hind drinking from a hillside spring or nibbling different plants. And then the poet zooms in on these individual plants. He talks about different grasses and rushes and then moves on to a variety of flowers, primroses, St. John's wood, wood orchids. So, taken as a whole, the poem is a poetic reflection of a healthy and functioning ecosystem before the coming of the sheep and before the um, uh, landscape changed as a result. So, this, this would be a very interesting source for ecologists to look at if they are looking at restoring mountain, mountain habitats for plants. Okay, a little, uh, a little snippet from Orden Kodichioich, another famous song in praise of another beautiful uh, place. It's 
on a less ambitious scale than the Dolden poem, but it's uh, equally well executed. And this is one of my favorite stanzas. Um, and when you bought up the lame before the na age of holiday book, Adam Rest Lim, the Hylish and Adigage will hit your Mianifer, for one of Jadifog, Erga, she. So again, the objective here is to create a word picture of a beloved place with all its flora and fauna, with place names anchoring the song in a real location. And again, the locations are accompanied by, say, uh, vignettes of a stag in the rutting season, a skylark flying up singing, or oh, here we have a salmon catching insects. Um, and the poet uses explicitly heroic imagery for this um, salmon leaping out of the water, eating midges in this case. So um, I think anything that eats midges is um, pretty praiseworthy and heroic in most people's book. So here is a salmon doing that. And I'm very fond of the colour imagery that the poet uses to describe the salmon, the blue-grey back, the silvery flashes, red spots and white tail. So this is very um, lovely. But not all was well in Donoghaban's day job at all times, because at some point he was transferred from the Misty Quarry, from Mamelon Forest in Redalgon to Dalmess in Glenetiv. And apparently he wasn't as happy as he was before. To add insult to injury, the man who replaced him in his old job, one Alastair McEwen, seems to have been less incompetent if the poet's testimony is to be believed. Um, so this is Kua Karachioich, the lament for Misty Kori. McEwen here is described in this stanza as unpopular and ill-tempered. Um, by implication, Donald Ban asserts that he himself was congenial and well-liked, and by all accounts, this is true. Also, Donald Ban here highlights McEwen's incompetence in stalking and shooting the deer. And he also talks about McEwen's poor care of the gun that is an essential tool of the job. He calls it a dingy, cro crooked bludgeon. It will not hit the stacks, couldn't hit a barn door at three paces. So um, that's again a contrast he constructs. But when I was in this job, my gun was always working fine, and I always brought home the venison for the dinner house and for, for, for my employers. Now, um, Donald Ban stops short of giving McEwen the full treatment of satire and invective. He certainly could do that if someone really annoyed him. He makes McEwen a figure of fun, and um, this, is, this is a very interesting passage. She moved her into a little girl of a ball and she found her some murder half Murder half down. Scott Hebuch Yachter and Rierke, we pluss at Nankia Pieter, the Christian Rainer Schierner, the Pier of the Lamp. The Seed, the Bachelor Rierker, the Tavi Sanat Skierhan, the Hitcher Skierhan, the Tierfin Sanan. We hear the Hurri the Yach, the Hitchin Tayerer, the Nach Bedel Vien, the Kurvien, and then Stern. So we kill is much better suited to catching hens in the farmyard for slaughter than to stalking deer on the hills. The picture of the poor fellow barely able to control the chickens he's carrying is deliberately ridiculous and emphasizes his alleged incompetence as a hunter. If he can't deal with a couple of hens, what chance does he have with a stag? And of course, looking after the chickens would have been women's work. Every big house would have had a henwife to do that. And the image um, from the 1940s shows how it is done competently. <laughs> a little side note, the first three lines 
are now on a flagstone in Macclesfield in Edinburgh, which was unveiled last Wednesday in honour of Donegal Band's birthday. So, McEwan's supposed incompetence has caused the once verdant and flourishing quarry to turn into an ecological disaster zone. Ha uschke sana chige na hule tugel hier chile, ne panik uonje uonje liglas do mi vlaste grand. Vier noch eines Tages in Kinder du ich warte, kann er greit wohl ich fast als ein Nachher und Putzenahm. Glummet in der Hache, nach Lugif do ein Salach, wo Tschuris und Kacher, nach Lachich, nach Fall. Schauen vor ein Salach ruhig ein, nach Rheine rund nach Urger, wo er kostlich wie Mord ruhig ein, nach Lohne verstand. In describing the devastation of the misty quarry, the poet uses the well-used poetic device of pathetic fallacy, where good or bad rule is reflected in the state of the natural world. The bad ruler here being McEwen. The pure clear water that the poet praises so elaborately elsewhere has turned murky and polluted, and the once rich plant life has here been reduced to one species only, the water lily. So he has a good go at poor McEwen, and um, it probably it probably wasn't as bad as the poet makes out. Essentially, Donald Barnes' disposition was cheerful and optimistic, and he was often able to see the funny side of things going wrong. And importantly, he can laugh at his own misfortunes, as he does in all that Schachter Chedeket's song on a hunting fiasco, where he tells us how he was out hunting one day, but had to return empty-handed from the hills. Oh, that's, a, that's a very lovely wee song. Okay. The poet takes us through a comically detailed process of loading his gun with the best of materials, and earlier has explained, with a wink and a nod, that he has a Spanish gun for hunting. Uh, despite the prohibition on weapons that the Gales were subject to, thanks to post-colonial legislation, but he was working for the Earl of Redalbum, and presumably an exemption was negotiated there. In this case, he tells us, he has powder from Glasgow, English backshot, he's put a new flint in, he has oiled the lock and he's kept the gun dry in its case. What could possibly go wrong on this hunting expedition? Next, he takes aim, pulls the trigger, and you can probably guess what happens next. The deer moves and he misses. And the hind bounds out of sight, unharmed, and on the bird trudges down the hill just as the rain sets in. <coughs> He draws on earlier praise poetry, which describes guns in some detail, and of course these guns never miss, so he makes fun of himself in this um, description. He concludes the song by consoling himself with a hope for better luck next time. Okay, remember how I've mentioned the desire back in 1761 for, of the Gales to have Tartan given back. Um, they still had to wait for a wee bit, but, the, but something else was given back in 1782, and that was the land that the uh, Jacobite um, leaders had lost and placed under government administration. The Act of Forfeiture was um, repealed, and Don Hoban comments with great approval on this song. So here he has heard the news and he is delighted. Um, the gentry have got their lands back. So he acts as a spokeswoman for the community of Gales who were affected by the act. The rising is described as um, ill-advised here or foolish 
And with 36 years of hindsight, this is probably a view shared by many. Now, Charles Edward Stewart was still alive at that point. He only died in 1788. But um, the repeal of the act serves to underline the reality that the Jacobites were a spent force. And Donald Chabon emphasizes there is now a new generation in place in almost all of the formerly Jacobite families. So here's a new beginning for the Gales with the repeal of the act. And he does this in a very interesting and traditional way. He follows this with a long, long roll call of clans who were affected by the forfeitures. He has uh, stanzas to Clan Donald, the Stuarts of Appin, the Camerons, the Frasers, the MacGregors, the MacPhersons, the Robertsons of Stuart, the Buchanans, and so on. The imagery of praise that he uses for them emphasizes military achievement and follows trajectories familiar from a long, long line of Jacobite roll call poems that enumerated those loyal to the cause, and now they're loyal to a new cause. And here's an example where heroic adjectives are very well represented. And the 18th century Gallic poets love their adjectives. Um, so here he talks about skill with sword and gun. So that's, you get that in Jacobite poetry as well. He doesn't tell us uh, overtly the name of it, doesn't tell us the clan, name of the clan, but he mentions place names. Struan, Struan, Du Huser. And um, if you know weird about the um, uh, Highland history, you can identify the Robertsons of Struan from that. So each formerly Jacobite clan is celebrated for their military prowess, and this has political significance. Now they're valuable to the state, and it's possible to read such, pa such passages also as a contribution to the ongoing rehabilitation of the Gales and to the ongoing uh, rebuilding of the confidence of the Gales themselves in their own culture after the post colonial Depression. Nostalgia and the respect for poetic tradition are not the only reasons for Donald Plan to follow these panegyric conventions. Uh, the British Army was always in need of loyal recruits for the Highland regiments um, in the successive conflicts of the budding empire. And um, the military potential of the Gaeltacht of the Highlands was very much of interest to the British government. So here's another political statement in this stanza. The Gales are loyal to George and keen to join the Highland regiments to play their part. And the restitution of the forfeited estates will serve to reinforce their loyalty. So chiefs will once again lead their men to fight in the service of the king and now the king is George. He praises those involved in negotiating and implementing the restoration of the Jacobites' estates. And this is intellectual and legal argument that he emphasizes um, in favor of restoration. But there's also a little note of criticism of government policy here. It's quite subtle, but look if you miss it. He says that this is there's a fundamental right that has been denied, and this is now going to be maintained again. The Gaelic line here is um, the maintenance of fundamental right. And we should note that the result of this legal process is described very resonantly in the last couplet of the stanza. Um, very, um, where is it? Who the Heide and the Unstale, the Cyrus and Coach Stolish. So that alliterates nicely. So lots of emphasis here. Um, all heirs obtained their gear and titles, their riches and their property. He, the poet uses the term cord, well, here in a cord of the genitive, meaning right, which of course is what the Jacobites claimed for themselves the right to the throne. And the forfeiture of the estates would be an instance of the opposite of right, 
um, an injustice. And this injustice has now been put right as the forfeited estates were um, restored. So George III now can claim the term right for himself since he has put the injustice to rights. And at the same time, the descendants of the Jacobites can rec recognize that their right has been restored. And Don Chaban reclaims terminology that was intimately connected to Jacobite ideology, and he again underlines the agenda of reconciliation that underlies the restoration of the forfeited estates. So for Don Chaban, the Jacobite cause had come to an end, and at the same time, an old wrong had at long last been put right. And a few years later, he even got the tartan back and he makes another song about that, but I thought we wouldn't have time for that. And I was right, so the last song that we'll look at is Kjer um, and That we can date to September 1802, when Don was back in his home district. And after this visit, when he climbed, had climbed Ben Dordain, he made this song. He was 78 years old. Now, Ben Dordain is a serious mountain. If I can climb a mountain of the size of Ben Dordain at the age of 78, I, won't be, I will be pretty pleased with myself. And in the song, Don Chupan meditates on his own life and on the changes he has seen. It's not devoid of touches of humour. There's always a, a, a humorous line, a funny line in Don Kuban's poetry. But overall, it is his most stately and most dignified song. And uh, singers sing that, um, they love singing that song still, and audience very much. Audience is very much enjoy it. And there's, of course, Ben Dora again. Here, the poet remembers his days as a gamekeeper with great fondness and in great detail, going off in the hill, into the hills, and he tells how he spent all day out in all weathers watching the deer, pursuing the deer, and remembers being fit and young at the time. And then he constructs a contrast to his old age, and he highlights its various um, effects, there are aches and twinges, that his teeth are not as good as they were, his eyesight is um, not, not as good as it was. Now, given that he's just climbed a pretty serious mountain, I'm not sure this can be taken entirely at face value. I think um, he, was, he was still pretty good for his age, but not as fit and nimble as he was when he was a youngster. The last couple of lines um, uh, referring to pursuit, that could be a tongue-in-cheek reference to his conduct at the Battle of Falkirk. He, now he can't run away from those dastardly Jacobites as fast as he did. And a final stanza, I mean, Jason Ernest, the Smoitian Maud and Madassa, and John of Goy, a barbish issue of Farsich Madaman. So they respect her in me, when Jenna Isha Kirchel, and I wish for her to some book on Sir Carlson. That's a muted instance of political commentary here. In a reference to the effects of the clearances, some of the well loved friends of his youth will have died. But others seem to have been displaced as a result of the introduction of sheep farming in the district. And that was in progress in many, many parts of the Highlands at that time, of course. So he is quite um, reflective and feels sad about the changes that are happening. Don Ban died on the 14th of May 1812 in Edinburgh at the age of 88. And he and his wife are buried in Greyfriars Kirkyard, but this monument was only erected some time after his death and after Nadi's death. And I've put a few suggestions up for further reading if anyone's interested. And it's him. Dunkelbahn's poetry has never been out of print, and his songs are, of course, still being sung. And I'd like to think 
he'd be pretty pleased about both. Thank you for listening. into his translation in a very um, pleasing manner.